lack of blood actually on this one. This short DVD is designed to explain the processes of microsclerotherapy, the treatment of telangiectasia, thread veins and spider veins. Well, they've been sort of making the leg ache a little bit, especially on prolonged walks. So I didn't know if it was that or not, which... And for how long have you noticed it? Um, I've had the vein um, some while, some years, but uh, it's sort of recently more troublesome. Okay. As you can see, this age has got a nice leg, but in the middle of her calf, she's got quite a large, quite a flamboyant, what some people call starbursts, or quite a, um, uh, a colourful flare. And in fact, if you feel it, you can actually feel that there's a fairly high pressure vein in the middle. So before I treat that, I would just pop an ultrasound on the leg, make sure I understand the size of the feeder vein. And if the feeder vein is more than two or three millimeters, it actually changes how you treat the leg. Microsclerotherapy is becoming more popular, especially with patients who want the treatment for cosmetic reasons. It's not expensive and can produce excellent results when a few simple procedures are followed correctly using the fibre vein range of products from STD Pharmaceuticals. Many patients find unsightly veins deeply upsetting and see successful treatment as greatly enhancing their quality of life. Women in particular often feel so embarrassed by the appearance of their untreated legs, they'll even avoid going on holiday for years at a time so as not to risk exposing the affected areas in shorts, skirts or swimsuits. It's horrible, especially when you go on holiday. When you sort of the first couple of days before you go on holiday, you think, oh crikey, because you don't know the people when you're going to be beside the pool and what have you. But sort of then after a couple of days, you think, well, they've seen them now. But people are always saying, what are those bruises? What have you done to your legs? So it is, and like I can't wear short skirts or I, w I wear a lot of crop trousers to hide it. And it is embarrassing. So it means a, a lot to you to get rid? Oh, definitely, yes, yeah, yeah. Well, I just feel when your legs are on show, people must look at them and think, gosh, what's wrong with that lady's legs? And it's certainly in a shorts and swimsuit situation where you're most aware of them. It's important to me because I would like to wear a skirt, basically. Um, with the veins being below a hemline, um, trying to cover them up is very difficult. So that's why I wanted them done. Is it embarrassing? Very embarrassing. People make comments. My daughter calls them the cracks in my legs, so, you know. And people do point them out to you, as if you've never seen them before. So, yeah, it is important. The length of time required for treatment will depend on the extent of the visible symptoms. Some patients will need only one session, others may require several, but overall levels of satisfaction after treatment are high. When the patient arrives for consultation, it's important to take a full medical history. How the treatment's carried out and how it works should be explained in detail until the patient clearly understands. Possible complications should be discussed, including the risk of skin pigmentation, the increased risk of migraine for those who are susceptible, and the very slight chance of a small necrotic ulcer. This treatment shouldn't be used on women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, and they must be fit enough to walk at least a mile a day. Once all this is understood, they must sign a consent form. Fibrovane injection is available in four strengths. This programme will explain the use of the 0.2% solution, the 0.5% solution and the 1% solution. Fibrovane 3% solution is used only for treating varicose veins. Training films for its use are also available from STD Pharmaceuticals. To use fibrovane injections for the treatment of telangiectasias, you'll also need limited stretch compression bandages, a 2 or 5 mil disposable syringe, an STD microsclerotherapy 30 gauge needle set, a 22 gauge or large bore disposable filling needle, gauze swabs, STD compression pads and STD sclero bands. You'll also require graduated compression stockings with an open toe and for this we recommend medi stockings. Of course, you must have a Sharps disposal bin on hand and a waterproof overstocking will be needed so the patient will be able to keep bandaging dry while showering after treatment. The treatment room should be well lit and should have washing facilities. There should be a patient couch or trolley. Depending on how good your eyesight is, you may want to have a magnifying lens or loops available. To begin with, it can be helpful to mark the relevant veins. Reticular veins often feed thread and spider veins and it's important to treat these to stop the problem continuing in the smaller veins.
These reticular veins are sometimes quite hard to see, in which case a vein light or Venilux can be useful. A portable duplex scanner can be extremely helpful, and if there's a suspicion the patient has venous insufficiency, then a duplex examination should be carried out. If there is arterial insufficiency, extra care should be taken when applying compression, and if in doubt, ankle or brachial pressures should be taken. The patient should be lying or sitting on the couch as they're most comfortable. This is vital to ensure they remain perfectly still, as if they move during the procedure it may have to be repeated. The microsclerotherapy needle has been specifically designed to treat even the smallest venules, like telangiectatic matting. While some experienced practitioners choose to use an ordinary 30 gauge needle with undoubted success, it can be tricky getting into very small veins. One of the tricks of injecting these sort of veins is the position of the patient and there's several things to make sure of. One is that the patient's leg should be flat on the couch. If you have it up in the air, um, the, pe the leg can move and in fact they can feel slightly vulnerable and injections I think can be slightly more uncomfortable. Secondly, you want to have very good vision, you want to be able to have your hands exactly on the spot, you don't want to be reaching over fiddling, so if I was going to inject there I'd have my hand under here, so you need to be careful. So there's, there's, you, you learn a few tricks as to how you're going to position the patient and um, to, to treat this side of the calf, what I do is just take the patient's leg over the top some more. If you take your leg over the top of your left and bring the other one backwards, and you can see immediately the leg is now in a very comfortable position. It's absolutely flat on the couch. Maureen feels secure. I know that she's not going to suddenly move when I'm injecting the leg. So, uh, um, and one of the other things, too, is to fairly regularly change your needle because the amount of chemical in um, the syringe will be more than to do it. And I think when you've injected between eight and ten veins, the needle starts to become slightly, slightly uh, blunter. And I think for both points of view, for the patient and for ourselves, it's better if the patient, if the needle is kept sharp. I find that by resting the, need, the syringe on the skin, you actually have complete control. Whereas if you're doing it from above, and some people will actually bend the, knee up, the needle upwards, and I'll show you how that's done, um, to actually they can approach the skin from a, um, a, a sort of a different angle, I find that if you rest the syringe on the skin and when you go in the skin actually the needle automatically remains parallel to the skin and you don't go too deep. The commonest mistake injecting these and when you've done a lot it looks really straightforward but when you first do it you'll find it's jolly difficult is to go through and deep to the vessel. So if you, by doing it this way my, you can see I've, you've got to learn to inject with your small finger. Those two fingers pull it, um, in this case longitudinally, and my middle finger stretches it in the opposite direction. So I've actually got three planes because when you put the needle into the vessel you don't want the skin to move and you can see as I went in there, um, in fact the skin doesn't move. And I think I've got mostly in there. I try and aim for a treating about the size of a, what I'd call a large postage stamp. This may, the whole lot may blanch and you run the risk of doing, getting a little chemical burn at the injection site and they can be sore. So if you see it filling all of them, stop at about a postage stamp. To begin the procedure, draw up the required amount of fibrovein using a filling needle. A green 22 gauge needle will usually do. Attach the microsclerotherapy needle set and make sure the patient's comfortable. For right-handed practitioners, it's very important to hold the syringe correctly in the left hand to allow easy movement of the plunger when the needle's in the vein. Hold the needle in your right hand just at the tip of the tubing, enabling you to see the fleck of blood inside on aspiration. Oh, and remember to make sure everything you need is within easy reach. At this point, you may choose to wipe the skin with an alcohol swab. Once the needle is properly into the vein with the bevel facing upwards, slowly inject the fibre vein until you either feel some resistance, the blanching is complete or the vein has disappeared. If you need to inject another site close to the first, do so as soon as possible, always remembering to apply compression as quickly as you can. Cover with a gauze swab and apply the bandage over the injected area. If needed, put the rubber pad in between the bandage to avoid contact with the skin. When bandaging a knee, it's important to place a pad at the back of the joint so the leg can move freely and the bandage doesn't wrinkle. I'm a compression man. I tend to put more compression on um, the most. So I would put a P-halved bandage on, then a stocking, and I would get them to take the bandage off tomorrow night and then continue the stocking 
during the day until any tenderness that occurred at the injection site had gone. I put a lot of compression on as well, but more with the class 2 stocking. Then. And I, I tend to only put the bandages on um, if there's one area that's really quite a big flare or a reticular vein. There's a knack to putting on compression, and if you get compression comfortable, then there's no doubt it makes a huge difference to the patient, even though they're actually going to have the compression on for 36, 48, 72 hours sometimes. The more comfortable it is, obviously, the more they'll tolerate it. So these little slippers come with the stockings, and you'll find they're quite useful because they actually allow it to slip over. And also, the way I put them on, they mean that you don't get a foot on your shirt. So I rest it up there. Now, these are fixed stretch cohesive bandages and they're called peer aft and they're the nicest bandage I've ever used and they basically stick to themselves but not to the patient and they're not they have no elastic materials in them it's a very clever cotton weave that you'll see when it's stretched and it's got a fixed stretch it doesn't stretch very much you just pass it around the leg and overlap about 50 percent and come down to the ankle and then go up again and it doesn't matter which direction you do this, but I usually do a, a, a spiral and two layers. And you'll see that when it's cut, it then just is self-adhesive. There's no, there's no material sticking to Maureen, and the material um, contains no rubber. So I've never had a reaction of pure haft from a patient. You ever had any reaction? That's fantastic. Now, there is a trick if you haven't got a Medi Butler, and I'm going to do it a different way this time. You bandage from the ankle up and you do your return bandage downwards or distally because the overlapping edge is now facing upwards. So when you put anything over it, it doesn't cause any disruption. Whereas if you come the other way, you can see how it rolls the bandage. And so. But in fact, with the Medi Butler, it doesn't matter. OK. Now, this, we've measured this lady for her stockings, and we use quad now hold-ups, which are... This is a class 2 stocking, usually with an open toe. Patients prefer that. And with a hold-up gripper material at the top. And these gripper materials now work jolly well, to be honest. Very much easier if you use the slippery foot bit and you can then remove it through the open toe. This is a Medi Butler, a very clever bit of lampshade device which uh, actually stretches apart and you find that you use that for getting over the knee and thigh and you put the stocking over it. Now the trick of doing this is to like, put it beside the patient, put the heel facing away from you because you want the heel to be at the back and you just feed the stocking over the device until the heel appears and it should appear if I've done this correctly right on the far end of the device and you'll see the heel actually coming up as it does there and the heel is now lying over the edge of the Medi Butler and um, you put it on basically this way now one of the problems of doing this is as you put it over the foot too much material slips off and you get a lot round the ankle and there's nothing left for the top of the leg so the trick is to hold it with your hands as I am so as you put it over the foot, you prevent the material slipping off. You must look down the Medi Butler to make sure you see all the toes, because if you trap the toes, it's jolly sore. And from this point, I'm actually feeding the material with my left hand. And if you look, I've actually got the heel in exactly the right place. It's fallen. You can see the angle of the heel material. And um, be very careful, too, that you don't leave rolls of material, because that can become jolly sore. You pull the the device apart and as you go up the leg you'll pull it and you'll see it actually and from this point I know I've got plenty of material left for the thigh so I go just above the knee and once I'm above the knee I remove the device because I'm now going to do the rest by hand. If I had a bandage on the thigh I'd have gone up slightly higher. You put that down and essentially just go up the leg. Make sure you get all of the That's it. And when you get to the top of the leg, you want this material flat on the skin. Now, there's a few bits of advice about this. This hold-up material is a very clever, sort of slightly tacky material. But over a day or two, the dry skin, in fact, can make this slippery. And every day or two, uh, they, they want to just wipe it with a warm cloth. And you'll find that keeps the material sticky and stops it slipping down. And they like being washed. Every time it's washed, it re that recovers as well. 
Now in some varicose veins this stocking stays in place for up to a week so that's very important you clean it. In Maureen's case it's going to be in place for 36 to 48 hours and in which case um, that probably isn't going to be a problem. You can see it fits quite nicely. Remove the foot piece, just, just pull it out, check that all the toes are uncovered. You, you don't want the stocking to go too far onto a toe. Check the heels in the right place and you can see the bandage hasn't been rucked at all and uh, that looks pretty comfortable. Okay. Patients should walk as much as possible and not disturb the stocking or bandage for at least 48 hours or up to two weeks for larger reticular veins. Immediately after treatment they should take a brisk 20 minute walk and do the same thing twice a day for at least the next two weeks. In fact, they should walk as much as possible during recuperation, not stand still for long periods and sit with their feet up when relaxing in the evenings. A follow-up appointment should be made but a gap of two weeks left before further treatment if required and they should be told not to have their legs waxed for at least six weeks after the final treatment. Properly carried out, microsclerotherapy produces excellent results. However, these will be less satisfactory if compression in the form of stockings and or bandages is inadequate. If an injection is accidentally given outside the vein, a necrotic ulcer may develop. In such a case, a compression pad, a limited stretch cotton crepe bandage and a class 2 compression stocking should be used. The patient should be encouraged to walk about as much as possible and oral antibiotics given to prevent infection of the site. Umivate cream is also helpful applied around the necrotic area but not directly on it. The ulcer will heal in time but it may take five months before the skin returns to normal and a small scar may be left. Any regular practitioner of microsclerotherapy is likely eventually to have a patient who develops an ulcer, but precise venipuncture and adequate compression should stop this happening again. Very rarely a necrotic area will develop because of an arterial venous shunt, as a very small arteriole may be injected. If thrombophlebitis develops, six or 800 milligrams of ibuprofen TDS may be prescribed, and Voltarol gel is also helpful. It's important the patient's given relevant explanatory notes about their treatment to take away with them to reinforce the messages given at the initial consultation, as described at the beginning of this film. We at STD Pharmaceuticals hope very much you've found this film helpful. If required, we'd be delighted to supply you with further information films on treatment of varicose veins. We also stock a range of printed materials on the subject as well as further reading on venous disease. If you need any further information on Fibrovein or any of the products used in this film, please contact us by letter at STD Pharmaceuticals, Plough Lane, Hereford, HR4 OEL. By telephone on 01432 373 555. By fax on 01432 373 556. Or by email via inquiries at stdfarm.co.uk. Also, please visit our website at www.stdfarm.co.uk. Dot UK.